have been talking about uh, thermal characterization and uh, thermal properties of geomaterials. So, in today's lecture I wish to uh, discuss about influence of various parameters on thermal properties of geomaterials and some of the case studies where centrifuge was used to model thermal properties of soils and this will follow uh, electrical characterization of geomaterials and I wish to wind up this course another 2 3 lectures I suppose. So, we have been talking about effect of heat on soils and thermal properties in particular. Now, the question is what is the effect of type of the soil? I think I had listed several parameters on which the thermal properties would depend and the most important parameter is type of the soil. You can call it as texture. Unfortunately, it is not easy to define what will be the effect of soil type on thermal properties of soils mainly because of the reason that this is a very complicated phenomena and hence it is quite difficult to quantify what will be the influence of soil type on its resistivity. When we talk about thermal properties, the thermal resistivity and conductivity are the main parameters which we uh, think of. Another problem is that when we talk about the type of the soil, its composition makes a makes life difficult alright. So, when we say that the clay or sands or silts or gravels, uh, these are very general terms. They cannot quantify the thermal properties and the effect of fraction of the particle size on thermal properties directly. Still some efforts have been done where people have tried to find out thermal resistivity of different type of soils as a function of dry density. This work was done by my student Gangadhar Rao long long back in 1998-99 where we took different type of soils black cotton soils, silty sand, fine sand, coarse sand and fly ash and then we tried to study how thermal resistivity in decreases with respect to dry density. So, as the logic says better the compaction, better the connectivity between the particles and hence better the conduction process and hence the resistivity is going to be less. So, the logic is like this when you compact a soil grain to grain contact increases and because of this uh, the heat migration from grain to grain in terms of conduction increases and hence the resistivity drops down. Another logic which we can give is when you are compacting the soil, the air from the pores is expelled out and because of this you should remember that the resistivity of air is more than the resistivity of minerals. So, when you are expelling out the air from the matrix of the soil mass, the resistivity will drop. So, these are the logics which normally are used to define how thermal resistivity of the soil changes with respect to the dry density. Another important thing which you will observe is where the influence of soil type comes, clays normally exhibit very high thermal resistivity. What it indicates is finer the particle size, higher the resistivity. Now, this could be attributed to various phenomena. When you have finer particle sizes, surface area is very high and dry state the material tends to you know uh, lock, retain lot of amount of air. So, finer the particle size, the resistivity is going to be more because of its tendency to trap more air into it. This could be a surfacial phenomena. So, what you will observe is the clays will give you very high resistivity as compared to sands and silts. So, if you if you 
look into this figure. This is the graph for clays and then followed by sands and coarse and fine sands. So, among fine and coarse sands also you will observe that the fine sand gives you more resistivity as compared to the coarse sand. So, this is how the particle size influence on thermal properties has been defined by people. The second important parameter is moisture content. So, again when you add water to the soil mass, you are expelling out air from it and just now we discussed that air has more resistivity as compared to the minerals. So, when you add more moisture to the soil mass, its resistivity should drop. Another reason could be when you add moisture to the soil, its dry density increases. So, water itself acts as a compacting force or densifying force for the soil. So, what we assume is that the heat conduction through the soil is basically electrolytic. The quantity of water present plays an important role because the heat migration could also take place through water. The amount of water which is present is dependent on a number of factors like weathering, sorry weather time, weather, time of the year, nature of the subsoil and the depth of the permanent water table. So, dry soils will depict low conductivity that means very high resistivity. However, when they become wet, their resistivity would drop. The reason is the resistivity of water is quite less which is 4000 degree centigrade centimeter per watt. And if you look into the graphical depiction of this phenomena, if you vary different densities and if you plot the resistivity with respect to the moisture content, we get a beautiful profile where we observe initially a rapid drop with a unit increase in the moisture content. So, when unit increase in the moisture content takes place, the thermal resistivity drops very rapidly. So, there is a sharp drop in the resistivity value and which stabilizes somewhere very close to a point which is known as critical moisture content. So, I will explain about what critical moisture content is all about. Another observation is starting from any density state, if you keep on adding water to the soil, a state comes beyond which all these curves converge and this becomes a point of convergence or a unique value. Now, this unique value corresponds to the resistivity of water which is approximately 165 degree centigrade centimeter per watt. So, if you extend these graphs, they will go and converge at about the resistivity of the water which is extremely less. That is the reason when you add water to the soil mass, its resistivity drops. Now, as I was talking about, there is something known as critical moisture content. The point of tangency of these graphs is defined as critical moisture content. So, somewhere here where most of these graphs have almost become stable or the curvature is changing, this point is defined as the critical moisture content. Whenever operations related to cable laying or pipeline laying is done, what should be kept in mind? What is in your opinion is the most critical parameter? Critical moisture content. Why? What is the meaning of critical moisture content? For that particular moisture content, sir, thermal resistivity will be very less. Yes, you are right. So, what is the practical implication of this? You are right that at this point, the critical moisture content is a point at which the thermal resistivity of the soil is going to be minimal. What is the significance of this? Why do we call it as critical? Loss of uh, electricity that will be lesser. Loss if of 
loss of electricity. Oh, that part will come later, but what is the logic associated with this? So, my question is what is the importance of critical moisture content? So, this is known as critical because beyond this everything is constant, yes. but less than this what is going to happen? Unit drop in moisture content below the critical moisture content is going to be dangerous for the system. Why? Look at the graph. Because thermal resistance increases, increases suddenly. Yes. That means a small change in moisture content on the left hand side of this graph would enhance the resistivity of the soil substantially. Now, this enhanced resistivity is going to be dangerous for a system which is buried inside the soil mass. Clear? It is just like your body. When you run in the summers, what happens? You sweat out. And if you still run, what may happen? You may collapse, you may faint. Why? Because most of the water from your body has gone out, salts have drained out, and you lose strength. So, that might be a critical moisture content of the body. Now, in this case, the critical moisture content is a point below which change in moisture is going to be dangerous to the systems which are emitting heat because the nearby surrounding soil is going to expose sorry it is not going to release the heat which gets generated easily or dissipate the heat easily. Where would you like to use this concept? So, suppose if I give you an example of let us say buried cables, this is where most of the electrical engineers want your feedback before they start the charging the cables. Charging the cables means they will lay the cables first, they will not pass the current unless they are sure that this neighboring soil, what is the thermal resistivity of this material. Now, what is going to happen? The moment you pass current I, there will be a heat generated which is equal to I square R. Now, this I square R is getting dissipated from this cable or any object, thermal object, clear. So, if RT is very high, what is going to happen? The heat which is getting emitted from the cable will not dissipate in the soil mass easily and hence what will happen? the temperature at the surface of the buried object is going to increase. When it increases beyond a certain limit, what will happen? The buried object may get damaged. In case of the cables, most of these cables burn. I mean you are passing current, but the cable itself gets burned because of the very high thermal resistivity of the soil. You got the point? Now, we call it as a free breathing, breathing, you know. Uh, mechanism. Each of the buried object, I think I had told this last time also, requires fresh oxygen. Whatever heat gets generated, it should get dissipated very quickly in the soil mass. If it does not happen, the temperature of the buried object will get enhanced and because of the enhanced temperatures, system may get deteriorated, get affected and so on. Another logic is if the temperature of the buried object particularly like cables increases over a period of time, what is going to happen? What will be the ill effect? Nirja. In what way is going to be detrimental to the health of the buried objects? You see if I square R is the heat which is coming out of the system. R itself is a function of temperature. The resistance of the wire is a function of temperature. In your 10 plus 2 physics you have studied, what is RT? Let us say at a given temperature R theta, this will be equal to R naught 1 plus alpha delta theta. That means, when temperature of the current carrying conductor increases, what happens to its resistance? It increases. What is the meaning of this? Either more heat will generate or if the resistance of the wire is more 
at a distance of 1 kilometer how much current or voltage you will be getting. So, there will be a voltage drop or a current drop are you realizing the implications. So, that means if I am passing current from let us say Pawai and by the time it reaches Murun or Bandup, if temperature keeps on rising what is going to happen your resistance per unit length is going to increase and because of that there will be a voltage drop by the time it reaches to the destination. So, there is a loss in ampicity we call it as loss in ampicity whatever current you are sending into the cable will not reach as the at the destined place because most of this current is used for heating up the element itself. You are realizing it is a beautiful combination of how geotechnical engineering helps electronics, electrical engineer, power electronics guys in laying their cables. So, what do they do? Next time when you are passing by a place where the cables are being laid, just tell them that I want to see the cable. So, design of cable itself is a big research area. So, what they do is they pass some coolant through the cables. I do not know you have seen the cable or not. These are very thick cables of say 12 inch diameter. There will be several packs of the conducting wires and these conducting wires will be passing through oil and this oil acts as a coolant. So, this is a very big subject all right. So, uh, now unless you find out the thermal resistivity of the material you cannot analyze the situation and what will happen if the temperature of the conducting wire keeps on increasing what will happen what will the ill effect. You remember this coupled phenomena we were talking about some time back. So, if the soil was initially saturated because of the heating inside the moisture gets displaced and then what will happen ultimately cracking. So, this is what is known as thermally induced cracking of soils and imagine if a foundation is sitting over here and if the zone of influence of heater is interacting with the is, is intercepting this zone of influence of the foundation there will be a problem because the moment cracking occurs there will be a loss of strength in the soils and hence this is going to be detrimental to the foundations. So, how easily you know thermal effects have been considered to be so detrimental to the foundation systems which were never done earlier. Is this part clear? So, critical moisture content is very very important I think I have told the entire story. Neighboring soil if the moisture content drops a little bit below the critical moisture content thermal resistivity will increase and all this story will come in picture. So, what should I do how to overcome this type of a phenomenon? There could be several ways what I should do is I should maintain the moisture content of the soil mass continuously is it possible you can do it you can make a trench and let it be flooded all the time with water very simple method, but then you have to be very careful of short circuiting. So, normally this technique is not adopted though technically it is fine. So, what should I do? Now, this is where we design we call it as hmm? yes we call it as thermal backfills. I think this is for the first time you are hearing thermal backfills. What was the job of uh, backfills in the retaining walls? To dissipate the load coming because of superstructure. First thing is to give a structural stability. So, here also when we are designing a thermal backfill the first thing is it should give a structural stability to the trench in which the pipes in which the cables are passing by. 
So, a typical combination would be like this, this will be a trench, what I will do is I will put a sort of a ventilator system over here, normally this is a good conductor of heat followed by lay the pipes or the cables and then bury this whole thing into a thermal backfill. So, a thermal backfill would be a material which is giving structural stability, protecting pipe from the environmental forces or mechanical loading and then it should first of all allow easy dissipation of heat. So, that means you have to synthesize a thermal backfill. So, that whatever heat is getting generated dissipates quickly, agreed. Now, this is where actually people want your help and guidance in designing different type of thermal backfills. I can replace this current carrying wire with a canister in which the radionuclear waste is contained. So, for me this becomes a unit inside which the nuclear waste is contained and this nuclear waste will emit heat, clear. So, I have created a second situation where the nuclear waste disposal components or canisters are buried deep inside the ground, I have to design a system which is not going to allow this heat to migrate up to the far regions, zone of influence I can contain, keeping in view that whatever heat is generating should not be detrimental to the canister itself, otherwise what will happen? The temperature of the canister will increase, it might melt and the moment the canister or the container, container melts whatever activity you have kept inside will come out into the geo environment. So, I hope you are realizing there are so many applications. Anything else which comes to your mind apart from these two examples where the critical moisture content would be of use or that becomes very critical. During like flow uh, oils in pipelines, deep buried. Pipelines. Very good. So it's all the same. Either current flows or a fluid flows. Yes, you're right. Remember, I had talked about cross-country pipelines, where it is very difficult to convey the fluids. Why? Suppose your cross-country pipelines are passing through Thar Desert where outside temperature is going to be 55 degree, clear and inside also you are passing the fluid or the current. So, this has to be a thermal balance between the outside world and the inside world. Now, it so happens many a time the temperature inside is going to be much more higher than the temperature outside. Now, how this system is going to dissipate the heat has to be designed and if you do not do this, what will happen? Because of the external heating the resistivity of the backfill is increasing and the moment that increases this poor guy has nothing much to do, you understand. So, this is a very big problem how to maintain the pipelines which are cross country number one which passes through different type of environmental conditions and soil conditions, different type of water condition, water table conditions and so on, it is a big subject, yes. Actually, sir, I wanted to say uh, one my literature review point related to that that to get a quantitative feel of <coughs> important of moisture content. So, in normal condition, if moisture content decrease by one percent, it will cause increase in fifteen degree of temperature. So, we can see the importance of moisture content in this kind of situation. Because Very good. Very good. So, one one percent moisture content change is going to increase the temperature by 15. This could be beyond the tolerance limit of the buried object and hence this could be very detrimental. Yes, fine. Any other situation which you think comes into your mind? And sir, one thing if we, have, if we sir, deal this with coarse grain soil and fine grain soil, 
then sir to maintain moisture content in fine grain soil will be more easier than coarse grain soil but at the same time thermal resistivity of coarse grain soil is uh, higher than fine grain soil so sir what will be optimum in these two conditions then you have to design the whole thing check out the paper which has been written by kabir kole that was a ac paper where we have designed thermal backfills we have given an algorithm how to design thermal backfills and second one would be by manthana david myself and uh, rangadhar rao so we have come out with dd therm i think i showed you last time so dd therm is a algorithm which is normally used to design thermal backfills any other situation where you think yeah this would be a issue so here we have discussed the situation where we want thermal resistivity to be less in some cases we can require thermal resistivity to be higher for example in case of cold regions uh, suppose oil is flowing through pipeline we want that waxing should not occur very good so yes so now you are doing a reverse process now you want to shield your system from the outside environment so outside environment let's say negative clear and you don't want this have to be affected by the or this this effect should should be felt by the buried system so then you have to design a backfill material which acts as a wall so it will not allow negative temperatures to be felt by the buried objects like you know thermal shielding which you do when when winters are there what do you do you wear a jacket so it's a sort of a thermal shielding so what should we do we should put a thermal jacket on the pipeline also so all these things are done it's very simple you treat this buried object as your body and the way you protect it against the environmental conditions the same thing you have to do for pipelines also under many circumstances pipelines are air conditioned also i think if you remember i had told this thing some time back there lot of money goes in maintaining a constant temperature on the body of the pipeline which is carrying any fluid so there there could be a situation where you have to maintain the temperatures of the pipelines yes sir uh, already you said uh, in electrical cables they will use the coolant surrounding the wire if we are using the coolant this tbf is necessary sir yeah even then because then again this is a design problem so it depends upon now i don't know whether you have ever seen a cable or not check it on the net they will show you very interesting pictures of the uh, power cables you know the power cables are something like this this is the outer casing in which there will be several combinations of spheroids so basically what electrical engineer does is if i give him rt value he will design a structure of the cable now within these cables there will be small small conduits clear and this rest of the space is filled up by a coolant so this is how most of the cables are designed now this geometry or architecture of the cable assembly is designed by people who are experts in power electronics so they design this assembly depending upon what rt you have and how much the current is being passed through the system so current becomes a thermal loading and that thermal loading is again like designing the foundation if you think philosophically the current is a thermal load or the genesis of the thermal load how it should be distributed through the different foundation pads now these each of the cable unit is nothing but a system of pylons where different piles are connected to a pile cap so the load is getting distributed to pylons philosophically right so this is how you have to design these things so yeah. it will be helpful in uh, msw also sir tbf so if it is uh, the msw is the biggest challenge would be say for example this itself is msw is it not so 
if I do not do thermal shielding of the surface or the base what is going to happen? All the heat which is generating because of thermochemical processes will get transmitted to the foundation soil and this foundation soil will crack because of moisture migration and the moment this foundation soil cracks what happens to the bearing? We lose bearing. So, the reason most of the back most of the landfills are in a very very dilapidated condition is there is no thermal shielding at the base and this system has already cracked or yielded or weathered. In case of organic soils I can I think you can imagine which is the case in cities like Bombay where most of the landfills are located in the coastal area coastal belt and chances are that in the coastal region you will be having organic soils organic clays. These organic clays because of elevated temperatures are going to get decayed and that is the reason your most of the landfills are non engineered they have not been designed carefully and hence all sorts of problems. Now, even if you want to extract methane out of it, it is going to be difficult because there is a differential settlement which is taking place. So, whatever systems you are going to install over here to extract methane or leachate are also getting cracked or dysfunctional because of the foundation problems. Now, these are the issues which are becoming very, very critical issues. I hope. Any other application which comes to your mind? Uh, in vapor extraction techniques, other techniques where extraction well is used, there this thermal. Yes, so it's a very what thermal acid is doing? You think like this. This is a heating source. So you are injecting soil heat into the soil. Now, if soil is not very conducting thermal, thermal conducting, what's going to happen? This will be a local heat of source which is not a good idea because for vapor extraction you wanted heat to disseminate disperse into the medium because unless this point gets heated up the vapor dissociation from soil mass will not take place. So, you are correct when you design vapor extraction the soil mass should be a good conductor. If soil mass happens to be a poor conductor of heat your vapor extraction through thermal heating might not work. So, these are big big challenges big question I think you can realize the importance of why these type of thoughts should be encompassed in geotechnical engineering. The last application would be not last one of the applications would be thermopiles. I think many of you are working in this area. What will be the fate of the thermal pile if the soil is highly resistive? So, suppose you have a pile and this is supposed to act like a thermopile and this soil is highly resisting or resistive clear. So, if the resistance is very high truly speaking the soil is shielding the pile from the rest of the soil mass and hence your piles are not going to be functional. The same is possible is valid when you do thermopiles for storing heat into the soil mass. If the resistivity is very high whatever heat you are storing in is not going to go into the medium because of very high resistivity. So, the local temperatures will become very high and the element of which the pile is made up of might yield concrete may crack steel may show lot of you know distresses and so on. Solar ponds, so, suppose this is a solar pond and if I am designing the foundation for the solar pond what is going to happen? If the soil is good conductor then a problem because whatever heat you are storing here will disseminate it is not a good idea then why did I create a pond. But suppose if this soil is highly resistive what is going to happen? this might become a boiling water pan. So, the temperatures may go so high that the water may start boiling up 
and then high temperatures of the water is going to be very much detrimental to the aquaculture which you are doing. Your fish and prawns are not going to survive more than certain temperature. You are getting the point. So, both ways there is a problem and hence this becomes a very interesting design problem. So, what you are going to grow here? Algae, fungi, fish, shrimps, crabs, whatever, I do not know. So, then you have to design the entire system so that the water inside the thermal solar, solar pond remains at that optimal temperature. So many applications I think I have talked about and I hope now you will realize that how foolish this is on our part as a geotechnical engineer not to consider thermal properties of soils. Yes. I would like to add uh, to his question, uh, like in MSW heat is being generated, this heat is also being used as ground coupled heat technology, that means it is being researched right now and this heat is being tried to be utilized for heating like structures and all. Yes. Any thermoactive system, fine, thermoactive means the system which is thermally active, buried pipelines, cables, piles, solar ponds, MSW, basal liners, your soil mass which has to be decontaminated, design of buffers, you remember thermal backfill is nothing but a buffer. Now I am talking about its thermal properties. Sometime back I discussed about its chemical properties, a buffer is the medium which reduces the thermal sorry chemical concentrations and it will not allow chemical concentration to go out into the geo environment, fine. So all these processes are getting coupled together now, a barrier should be the one which is thermally optimal, chemically optimal, mechanically optimal, when it gets heated up it should not release the moisture otherwise there will be thermal cracking and so on. Now the question is how would you design these systems, is this part clear? There are a lot of questions and let of, less of answers. So this is where more and more R&D is to be done. Now come out of all these situations and the last situation which we can think of today is permafrost. Sir, uh, you told that uh when you dump nuclear waste into the deep into the ground, we use uh, some sort of soiling uh, soil uh, which is optimal soiling to cover it. Yeah, so but what you are talking about is design of the thermal backfills. So now the question is the soil which I am going to use here should be compactable also. Now if I use sands, you know the problems, permeability is very high, I cannot take chance, I cannot use a material for which permeability is very high, water from both the sides will ingress into it. I have to add then sands and clays or some minerals together. This is what is known as your buffers. So what they do is they use bentonite, pure bentonite cannot be compacted, pure bentonite will crack because of heating, pure bentonite will not give you so much high strength, clear and consolidation will be a very big problem. So, how to come out of this situation? Mix bentonite with sands. So, a lot of people have done this research. They are working on sand bentonite mixes and they talk about depending upon the applications in which you are trying to use this composite, you have to test its behavior. Fine? Yeah. Yeah, so I was talking about. Uh, this thing permafrost. So, the situation is going to be much worse when you have permafrost existing in the soil mass and then you have a system like this. So, thermal gradients are going to be much more higher. So, thermal loading is going to be much more higher on the systems and then you have to design the whole thing accordingly, fine. So, this is where it is okay, any question? Sorry? Yeah, when you do blasting operations, yes, definitely because of, so, so for me this is a buried source of heat, clear? It could be anything, 
it could be a chemical process. So, this becomes a buried source of heat. Now, the question is how heat is going to migrate and if it migrates what is going to happen, if it does not migrate what is going to happen, I have to take care of both the situations. You realize that the importance of thermal properties of soils and geomaterials. Okay. So, what basically I wanted to convey is thermal resistivity decreases with moisture content because thermal resistivity of water is less. So, as you keep on adding moisture to the soil mass, it tends towards the sludgy state and where water takes over the soil grains and hence the resistivity drops. Another thing which we learned from this figure is that uh, fine grain materials will show you high resistivity as compared to coarse grain materials that I showed in the previous graph also. So, all, all this I have discussed like you can go through my notes and can follow what I am talking about. The soil has greatest potential for induced instability when moisture content is below its moisture content which I have discussed. A soil that is better able to retain its moisture as well as is efficient to re-wet when dried will have better thermal performance characteristics. You have to choose minerals which would show you very optimal wetting and drying mechanisms. Now, this is best accomplished with a well graded sand to fine gravel you know sound mineral log with a small percentage of fines. This is a concept of thermal backfill. The way you create concrete, you have to create a thermal backfill system on. In fact, concrete also is used as a thermal backfill in most of the situations because of a compact structure, it will act as a good conductor of heat and then this is a multi-phase system where you have fine grained soils post grain soils, cement, water mixed together and then a composite is created which is giving structural shielding against the external loads. Number one, number two is it acts as a good conductor of heat. And another concept is if you want to achieve good densities, what you should do? You should add more coarse material or fine material in the you know parent material. So, if you are working with clay, you have to add more of coarser fraction. If you are working with sands to give some cohesion, you have to add some fine material. So, these are the composites which you have to design. Ultimately, the bottom line is that all these type of systems have to be designed. Is this okay? Just now I talked about that the soils which have peculiar wetting and drying response which is known as terraces is also very important when you design thermal backfills. So, basically the effect of moisture content on the thermal conductivity of some soils has been found to depend on whether the soil is in the process of drying or wetting. Uh, you know cricket pitches is a good very good example of uh, application of this concept. You must have seen after the first one innings is over, what captains do? They ask for a roller and they ask for compacting the pitch. So, it depends upon the captain and his team whether the batsmen are good ones or bowlers are good ones, what he or she will do? He or she will say, I want a heavy roller or a light roller. Then comes the concept of the wicket whether it has grass or not. So, to grow the grass also you have to have optimal temperature within that thickness of the cricket pitch. If the constant temperature is not maintained, grass cannot be grown. So, most of the time you have on the wickets grass which is more suitable and conducive for fast bowling. So, if I have fast bowlers in my, in my team, what I will be doing? I always will have grass on the pitch. But like Indian team most of the time what do they do? They have shaved pitches, they have clay pitches without any grass because spinners will play on them. 
So, they make pitches without any grass, barren pitches. They will crack once the match starts because of the sun conditions of air and weather and climate conditions and so on. So, as moisture goes out of the system, it will crack, it becomes more and more conducive to the spin bowlers and that is what they predict after on the fourth day of the match, the pitch will crack and then it will become more spin friendly. So, all these type of predictions are done when you design the pitches and the turfs for different sports, there is a lot of applications. So, the question is how would you identify these type of minerals? So, this basically as far as research is concerned, it leads to a point that minerals should be tested for their wetting and drying cycles. Now, this type of work was done by Kanan and uh, Sneha Jayant and they have published their papers in uh, several journals where we are talking about how easy or difficult for the soil would be to get dried up and from this that stage pick up water to become wet. Now, this is where if you read my papers, these papers, we have talked about the tendency of the system, resilience of the system to become wet from the dry state, which we call as uptake capacity of soil. Imagine in agricultural sciences, suppose if you water the plants today, clear? That means you have made the soils wet and subsequently these soils will dry out and a state of the material or the soil will be achieved where the soil becomes completely dry. Now, if this soil cannot uptake moisture tomorrow when the irrigation is done, what will happen to the plants? They will die. So, if you go through these papers, you will realize that we have talked about the spring analogy in the context of pores also. So, we create suction, we create pores, we destroy pores by adding water. Number of cycles which nature gives to the soil mass in the process of weathering, in the process of formation, in the process of climatic changes. The resilience of the soil to expel moisture and uptake moisture might change. Now, if you are dealing with these type of systems which are dead and passive, most of the desired objectives cannot be fulfilled. So, you have to differentiate between the soils which are hysteric, which are hysteresis dependent or hysteresis not dependent. So, this is where the philosophy comes in the picture. Have you followed this? How many applications I have talked about? Agriculture to sports to power industry to infrastructure industry to runways to nuclear industry to thermal infrastructures to solar ponds, aquaculture, fishing, cold storages. You, you design a cold storage system, I hope you can realize and what do you do in cold storage systems? You have to air condition the entire thing. So, insulation of the walls can be done very easily in cold climates minus 30, minus 40 degree. How do they survive? They use insulated walls and roofs, but what about the foundations? So, most of the heat will migrate through the foundations of the warehouses. Imagine how much amount of energy you have to spend to keep the temperature at the constant level. So, these concepts are becoming a part of geotechnical engineering in today's world. You design the foundation not only for the load bearing and settlements. The third criteria is they should be thermally non-active. Are you understanding this point? So, in this case which we talked about landfill, enough bearing should be there, no settlement should be there, heat migration should also be ruled out. Said if we increase the moisture content of the soil, if beyond, I increase the moisture content of the soil beyond critical moisture content, I yes, mean, should there be any history because because uh, beyond that my thermal resistivity is constant, so it will not depend on whether I am it's in dry cycle or that's right. But then it depends upon the purpose which you are uh, for which you are designing the whole system. So if you are supplying all the time free moisture to the soil, it is not very correct. Because in the system where I am disposing waste and if I am maintaining the moisture content very high, what will happen to the hydraulic conductivity? It is not a good sign. 
So, it is something like this that you know this is where the profession becomes very important the practice of these concepts in the real life situation becomes very very important and there is no medicine that you just give this medicine and the patient will be cured then you have to design it then you have to understand the whole phenomena and I am sure now you must be realizing that we are we are you converging all these concepts in one in one design hydraulic conductivity compactibility consolidation effects shear strength parameters heat migration clear chemical activity migration disintegration biological effects everything are now coming together when you design these type of systems you cannot cut them off from one phenomena okay challenging area to work on is this correct or not this is what present day geomechanics is I have not talked about dissociation of gas hydrates and all please forget about those things. <laughs> this is where again thermal energy comes into the picture fine. Effect of dissolved salts in water this is also going to be a big parameter. Now what you are asking just now is if I maintain the moisture content in the backfills I might achieve you know the required results. Then what happens in the coastal areas where most of the time water table is so high that you cannot do even trenching process. Now this is where the difficulty comes if salts are present in the water what will happen to the freezing point why do you add sodium chloride to in the ice box sorry to lower the freezing point clear that means minus 10 to minus 20 I can wait at minus 20 I can freeze the system for a pretty long time. Now this is where again the effect of heating so suppose if you boil the heat uh, salt water and suppose if you boil the fresh water what will be the difference which one will boil first. Fresh water fresh water means deionized water where we do not have ions heat conduction in deionized water will be extremely less because there is no any conductivity but the moment you add salt what will happen the salts will start doing more ionic mobility and intermixing of the convective currents clear. So what salt does it enhances the conductivity of heat in a system. Now the question is it is difficult to take into account these issues because when you are designing you know there are so many parameters for which you are designing the things. So but the bottom line is when you add salts into the solutions or the soils resistivity will drop down this could be used by you when you talk about let us say you know decontamination of soils which are heavily contaminated by adding some salts into them and one good example is ground freezing is done with the help of brine solution circulation what brine does heat exchange with the soil becomes very fast. So brine is nothing but sodium chloride when you recirculate when you circulate the sodium chloride solution in a loop form in the soil mass the heat exchange from the soil is going to be much more efficient as compared to the normal water that is it. So everything is interlinked you know hope you are realizing this. In western countries where most of the time foundations and the air strips remain frozen because of permafrost what do they do just now you said so how to get rid of permafrost lower down the freezing point. So if outside temperature is minus 20 I will create inside the foundation minus 40 by adding salts you got the answer but a person like me will come forward environmental geotechnologist what he will do he will sue you why yes so the moment you put salt in the foundations what is going to happen 
these salts will migrate into the ground water and they will contaminate it. Very big problem western world is facing. Did you realize the outcome of the story? So, one thing is they have to negotiate with the permafrost, otherwise landings cannot occur on the air strips, the entire air strip is frozen. In order to do that, what do they do? They sprinkle salt and then what happens to the salt? It goes into the ground water and then the problems start. Beautiful research problem, you will find lot of papers in this area, got it? Read those areas and start a new concept. Life is not so easy. So, you try to lower down the temperatures to take care of the permafrost and in the process you created contamination of the soil, be careful. Okay. So, effect of particle size distribution, closeness of packing of the grains, I think I have discussed all these things quite in details. Uh, we can talk about few interesting things, you know, well we have soils which are well graded and when we have soils which are poorly graded, so size, shape and their morphology plays a very important role because ultimately all of these parameters are going to influence the density of the system. Effect of temperature, temperature also plays a very important role, you know initial temperature or the elevated temperatures. So, I am skipping all this, you can read this, but just I will mean, see the gist of the entire thing I have already given you, you can read through. Then there are seasonal variations, again very difficult to quantify them, rains followed by rains dry period, followed by dry period rains and then comes cold and where cold climate, again cycles of these things are happening, so these have to be quantified. Then comes the anisotropy, the anisotropy of the soil is a big challenge to overcome. So, when you talk about anisotropy, there are either conductivity parallel to the plane or perpendicular to the plane. So, the way hydraulic conductivity changes, you know, KH, KV. Similarly, we can use the terms RTH thermal residuity in the horizontal direction, thermal conductivity in the vertical direction and then try to take into account these effects. Now, what, what happens is when you compact the soil perpendicular to the plane of compaction and parallel to the plane of compaction, the state of compaction is different and hence the conductivities are going to be different. Now, coming to the centrifuge modeling aspects of uh, the entire processes, all these things scaling factors are known to you. Now, when we started working in this area, we were not aware of you know how thermal properties will get modeled. So, the credit goes to my student Dr. Krishnaya who did these studies and then who has derived scaling loss for heat migration in centrifuge. So, before his thesis we were not knowing how thermal conductivity gets modeled, how thermal diffusivity gets modeled, how specific heat gets modeled, how heat flux gets modeled. So, we did these experiments in the centrifuge and this type of a setup was done by him, very intelligently designed setup. This paper we had published in International Journal of um, centrifuge modeling, physical and IIJPM in geotechnical engineering, International Journal of Physical Modeling in Geo, Geotechnical Engineering, Geotechnics. So, earlier this was from Thailand or somewhere, now it is being published by ICE. So, we designed this whole system where we kept the data logger here. We had the buckets of the centrifuge where we designed the whole system where we have a thermal probe, thermocouples embedded into the soil mass, then counterweight we designed as the batteries and we did complete data logging of the process inside the centrifuge. A very interesting concept which we used here, 
we had a switch when centrifuge is not spinning this switch is not in touch with the body of the sample and hence the current will not flow through the probe which we are inserted here. But the moment it comes in flight the circuit gets completed because the switch which you are seeing over here gets attached to the body of the sample and then current passes through the system a very ingenious idea which he did. This is how it looks like. I still remember you know now it's, it, it looks so easy but when we are designing these things uh, it was a nightmarish experience. It took several years to design this type of system for doing centrifuge modeling in of heat migration in a in a model. This is how it looks like we use a data logger this is a switch which I am talking about when centrifuge is not spinning it remains disconnected from the sample and current does not get passed through it. But the moment this system is in flight the buckets become horizontal this gets connected and the current passes through and you can do the studies. So, this is the outcome of the centrifuge modeling studies. Fortunately, what we realize is all the properties remain constant, but then this was a finding. Before this, there was no official record of what really happens to the thermal properties, and the logic is thermal properties of a material are fundamental properties, inherent properties, so they will not change, they should not change as a function of n like diffusion coefficient if you remember. Diffusion coefficient does not depend upon the environmental conditions under which you are doing the experiment particularly G not about temperature and all. So, here we showed that thermal resistivity remains constant, thermal diffusivity remains constant, specific heat remains constant. This paper we published in experimental thermal and fluid sciences in 2003, 14 years back. This was the first timer at that time, nobody used to think about all these things. The second paper which you are talking about was in 2004, Scientific Modeling of Heat Migration in Soils, International Journal of Physical Modeling and Geotechnics. Dr. Krishnaya is right now the registrar of JNTU, you must be aware of, he is a big man. Then we got these type of results which are very useful in designing the systems. Uh, this is the sample which I showed you just now, thermal probe is embedded into it, different type of thermocouples are embedded into it. And basically I want to see how heat migrates as a function of radial distance, depth that is why the depth of embedment of thermocouples is different you will see and their radial distance are different. So, two types of modelings are done, we call them as modelling of models. One is with respect to time, another one is with respect to distance. So, this is spatial, this is sorry this is spatial, this is temporal. What you will observe is at different n values depending upon the distance where you are measuring the temperature, the nearest point to the thermal object achieves maximum temperature as compared to the point which is sitting away from the buried object which is the blue one. We wanted to see what is the response of heat migration at different n values or g values for different radial distances. So, the trends are almost same and this is where we have done time modeling as time increases what happens at different distances. So, when time is more what will happen to the temperature? The temperature will be more. So, this is what we have modeled over here. We also wanted to show that there is a uniqueness in the results. 
So, we did the modeling exercise and we used a parameter which is defined as percentage increase in temperature because of heating with respect to radial distance for a given time for different g values. So, the beauty of the exercise is that when you superimpose the results you will find that all the results at different g values superimpose at each other and this is what shows that your results are independent of g value and this proves that modeling of models is valid. So, this was the first effort done by somebody for modeling the heat migration in geomaterials. Similarly, we did modeling of models for distance also and we showed that there is a absolute you know validity of modeling of models by putting percentage temperature increase at a given distance with respect to time. So, what we are trying to do essentially is we are trying to see how heat migrates in the geomaterials over a period of time and distance clear. So, these simple experiments build up lot of confidence when you do research and when you delegate your research from laboratory into the field. Unfortunately, these type of studies cannot be done for stiff materials because there you are inserting rock sorry you cannot insert probes thermocouples in a stiff material. So, the question was how to work in rocks, concrete and different type of stick material soils. So, this is where we did uh, mathematical modeling by using ANSYS. This is how the top view of the setup looks like. You have the thermal probe fitted in the center of the sample and then at different radial distances you have thermocouples embedded into them. So, we take one fourth of the sample one fourth quadrant and then we did some sort of analysis using ANSYS and there we have shown that this interface is the thermal probe and this is how the heat migrates into the geomaterials. Nowadays you have different software you can analyze the problems very recently Somnath used uh, Comsol, MW and uh, this soil vision package for modeling how heat migrates into the systems. Those of you who are working in thermal piles and uh, thermoactive systems these type of studies will be very very useful. The idea was to derive the scaling laws for heating. So, we analyze the results which we obtained from experiments and from the FEM results and we have shown that there is a perfect matching between the results. What it indicates is the temperature in the soil mass increases as a function of time at different radial distances. So, then we design this uh, scaling factors. that was the beauty of the research. So, we define you know temperature in prototype and temperature in the no this is the time sorry I am sorry this is the time in the prototype and time in the model as a function of n x is unknown and then we used x term by taking the log of this for different temperatures using finite element model and centrifuge test results we obtain the value of x. So, you will see that x is very close to 2 1.8 1.9 is close to 2. So, what it indicates is that the time taken by heat flux to migrate in the prototype is n square times the time taken by heat flux to migrate in the model. So, scaling law for the heat migration in geomaterials was established as n square which is valid conceptually because heat migration is nothing but a diffusion phenomena. 
So, diffusion processes get modeled n square times and hence everything is in order. So, I just shown you some of the studies which were done by my students in uh, this concept of how heat migrates through the geomaterials. These were very bold initiatives which were taken long long back. I hope you can realize when people are not aware of you know what these processes are and what their implications would be. So, credit goes to all these guys who have spent their precious time in creating the knowledge and I am sure you must have realized that these type of topics have beautiful applications in today's world and uh, only thing is we have to master them fine. So, with this I will stop discussion on thermal properties of geomaterials. Any doubts? Yes. Sir, I am not clear about this centrifuge modeling thing. At, at higher G values, uh, does the density increase? No, 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 no. Density does not change. Density of what? Of oh, soil. No, density will not change because you should read the papers which are written by uh, A.K. Gupta, where we have shown that the stresses which are getting delegated on the samples are extremely low. So, centrifugation, geotechnical centrifugation does not result in densification of soil. But if you are talking about the liquid which is present in the soil mass and if you are talking about its change in the properties that is valid. So, then there are different options either you use the homologous points concepts and use different type of fluids synthetic fluids which are artificially intelligent fluids which change their viscosity and density depending upon the G value, but they are extremely expensive and people in uh, Cambridge have used it. Otherwise for all practical purposes the density compacted state of the material remains constant, because the basic assumption in centrifugal modeling is that we maintain stress strain same which is not correct, but let us not go into all those discrepancies, yes. Sir, why thermal resistivity of fine particles are more than coarse particles? I think I, I discussed this point because of very high surface area the tendency of the material is to retain more, more, more air. So, fine particles have very high surface area, if they are in the dry form they retain lot of air and air is an insulator to heat, this is one of the reasons, right. Yes. Anything? Yeah. Okay then, thank you.